national and international cooperation to address teacher shortages. So that is what is this session is about. If that's why you wanted to be in, then that is the right place. Okay. Uh, I think we should start. It's almost uh, 1,400 hours. I'm not sure if uh, all the panelists are here or do we still have other panelists? Maybe if I can just call them forward and then I'll see if they are all here. So on our panel this afternoon, we have the Director for Policy and Lifelong Learning at UNESCO, Mr. Borin Chakrun. If you can come forward as we give him a round of applause. Then we have the director in the Directorate for Education and Skills uh, for OECD. He is not available in person, so we will have a video recording that we are going to play. Uh, we have Education Specialist Policy Officer for the European Union, Mr. Voter Van Damme. Thank you very much. And then we have Director General of the Arab Bureau of Education for the Gulf States, ABEX, Mr. Abdurrahman Mohammed Al Asmi. We have UNESCO SDG for Youth and Student Network, Mr. Lien and Vega. I hope I pronounced your surname correctly. Thank you. Okay, and finally, we have the Global Partnership for Education Secretariat, GPE, Ms. Christina Sonnenbeck. So these are our panelists uh, for this afternoon. Let me take this opportunity to welcome all of you to this uh, panel discussion. I, by now, I'm sure you are aware of the services that are available at the conference, the interpretation services. If you will need one, please make sure that you have a headphone next to you. So just to give a context, uh, we have been discussing the issue about shortages of teachers and the challenges that teachers are facing uh, in various aspects of their teaching. And we have also shared with each other how different countries are experiencing shortages in different ways. And so now we are shifting from talking about the problem to talking about what the solutions are. And in this regard, that's why we are going to be focusing on the issue of national and international cooperation. So even with numerous options that are available to address teacher shortages, for policymakers, additional transformative measures are needed to validate teaching as an attractive profession with a pressing need. Okay, let me put it this way. Let me start again that sentence because my phone is acting up here. Okay, so even with the numerous options available to address teacher shortages for policymakers, additional transformative measures are needed uh, to validate teaching as an attractive profession with a pressing world deadline to achieve the SDG for the SDGs. To achieve this transformation, national and international cooperation and solidarity are needed. 
Moreover, education systems continue to grow. Likewise, data analytics and digital technology continue to grow in importance for the purposes of teacher management issues, education management information systems, your EMIS, or a specific teacher management information systems, teams can prove invaluable in terms of general organization and efficiency, as well as improved fiscal responsibility. In addition, to fully eliminate global teacher shortages, governments and ministries must first develop realistic, sustainable ways to finance teacher remuneration and professionalization, as well as the infrastructure and support systems needed to produce and retain enough qualified teachers. So this plenary will discuss national or international partnerships and the global community's role through international cooperation to achieve the innovations and transformations that will enhance the attractiveness of the teaching profession. It will also address different organizations' contributions to the international cooperation on teacher shortages, especially when it comes to issues of financing, reliable data, and broader teacher-related initiatives. So based on this context, I will then call upon our speakers uh, to address some of the questions that we have prepared uh, to deal with this topic. And we will start with Mr. Burin Chakrun, the Director of Policy and uh, Lifelong Learning at UNESCO. So, sir, given the United Nations Transforming Education Summit in 2022, which marked a milestone in global cooperation, underlining the central role of teachers, what role can UNESCO play in supporting countries to achieve their national commitments in areas such as teacher supply, deployment, improved teacher working conditions, and teacher training and professional development? You have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much, Shinok, and uh, uh, good afternoon to all colleagues. Uh, I, I will uh, structure my intervention in the five minutes that you kindly uh, gave around uh, four uh, elements of uh, what I consider important for UNESCO's work, but for the international community and the interplay between the national and, and the global uh, agenda. First, uh, let me start with the Transforming Education Summit and frame it as part of the SDG4 agenda. SDG4 remains our compass is the direction that we are taking, is the agenda that we are having, and the Transforming Education Summit is part of that agenda setting to which UNESCO, together with other uh, organizations, uh, do contribute, as uh, the TTF Policy Dialogue Forum is also an agenda setting moment where, in which UNESCO, as a host of the Teacher Task Force, together with the other members of the TTF, is setting an agenda around how we are addressing the teacher shortages and uh, how internationally we can collaborate to advance uh, this agenda. So this agenda setting dimension is very important and it's about um, raising the voice about the importance of teachers in uh, advancing uh, SDG4. That's the first part of the contribution that UNESCO brings together with other partners. The second, I think uh, the importance of normative instrument is critical here. One is that teachers, teacher shortages challenges, is about the right to education. So uh, our agenda is about a normative agenda about human rights and the right to education. But within that broader set of instruments, we have also UNESCO ILO recommendations on teachers. And uh, as you have heard from uh, Madame Giannini, from my colleague Carlos and other colleagues, and uh, colleagues from the ILO, or Oliver, uh, it's about updating the recommendation which was adopted in 1966 to uh, an, an agenda that is uh, uh, more 
with the, with the contemporary challenges. So the recommendations and updating the normative instrument on ILO, UNESCO um, uh, recommendation on teachers is part of that normative work. A third normative work is the ISCAD T, and you are mentioning um, a director of this session about data. And today, when we look at the way we are collecting data on teachers, we are far from having the right picture on what is the situation in terms of teacher uh, qualifications, access to the teaching profession. Sometimes even the number of teachers, we don't have it exactly across, across the, the countries. So iscad t is an instrument for collecting um, data and for collecting information. To finish with the normative instruments, and because we are speaking about mobility and about recognizing qualification of teachers, we have adopted regional and global conventions on higher education qualification and recognition of, of higher education qualification. In Africa, ADIS convention is a convention that helps countries recognize qualification across border. At the global level, we have a global convention on the recognition of higher education qualifications. So that's part of the way we valorize the, the qualification of the teaching profession, eventually facilitate the mobility and uh, addressing teacher shortages in, in this context. That's about the, the second uh, element is about normative. And let me finish with the policy support to countries because that's part of what UNESCO does. Uh, and uh, together with the TTF partners, we have developed a teacher policy guide that is, uh, I would say, uh, uh, an, an, a way of framing how countries can develop teacher policies, how they can make them uh, be implemented, how to engage in a social dialogue, how to address uh, teacher shortages. And as part of the, the guide, we have developed tools for assessing, for estimating uh, the cost of the, uh, the addressing teacher shortages. And those are resources that are to be put at disposal of member states to help them plan and address uh, teacher shortages uh, dimension. Let me finish with the last point, which I think uh, is very important. The global report gave us a very, uh, I would say, uh, granular analysis of what is the situation of teacher shortages, what are the challenges, but also what are the solutions, what are the practices? And I think uh, as a follow-up is how we make the global report an action-oriented document, is how we can engage countries in terms of addressing those challenges, learning from the different experiences and putting at their disposal a pack of resources that is stemming from the report on how you address uh, disparities between rural and urban, how you incentivize teachers, how you organize teacher professional development, how you develop the working condition, and finally, how you organize the social dialogue and the policy dialogue with the teachers. We have, an, I would say, a wealth of uh, experiences, of resources, of framework, that the global report is producing that can be put at disposal and that we can implement in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what we will do is that after the input of every speaker will take questions, but the speaker will not respond to questions. We'll just note the questions. We'll go through all the speakers, take questions per, per topic, and then we'll come back for the speakers then to respond to their questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so yesterday in the Africa group, uh, there was a concern raised about the fact that we have all these instruments that we produce, but what we are not monitoring is whether are they being effectively utilized. So from UNESCO's pe perspective, do you have any means through which you are able to monitor how these normative instruments are being applied. Yeah, okay, if you can just note that, let's take other questions, yes. Are there any questions relating to what has been presented here from the floor? Yes, there's a hand there, number one. Let me recognize other hands. Number two, please remember your number. Okay, those are the only two. Yes, please go ahead. The gentleman there in the white shirt, I thought he was raising his hand. Okay, let's go this way, number two. Okay, uh, I have a question for Dr. Uh, Burhan. Uh, is the global uh, report translated uh, into the Arabic uh, 
uh, language. And if not, I propose, uh, since uh, we have many Arab states here, to help in uh, translating into the Arabic language. Thank you. OK. All right, so I'm sure you've noted that, the two questions. We'll then go to the question for the second presenter, which will be a video recording. And the video will address the question on what type of strategies are needed, both globally and nationally, to improve the status and working conditions of teachers? And what role does data collection and the use of education statistics play to aid the transformation of education and the central role of teachers. Can we get the video played? Thank you for inviting me to the Teachers Task Force Dialogue. You've chosen the topic of the day, how do we make teaching more attractive? Now, if teacher shortages would be universal, it would be hard to find good answers to this question. But the truth is, it varies a lot across countries. You know, some countries face dire teacher shortages, but in others, teaching remains an attractive career choice. And those differences among countries are not simply explained you know, by, by salaries or material conditions. Luxembourg pays the highest teacher salaries, and still, faces huge teacher shortages. And Finland salaries are low by OECD standards, and yet there are 10 applicants queuing up for every teaching post. And if you look at this more systematically, you actually find very little of a relationship between material conditions and the attractiveness of the teaching profession. There's even no clear relationship between teacher salaries and teacher self-efficacy. For example, the share of teachers who say they can support students through the use of digital technologies. What this says is that money only gets you so far. Now, money is an obvious extrinsic demotivator. Now, when salaries are low, nobody wants to work for you. But money is rarely an intrinsic motivator for people working in education. A much more telling concept is the social status of teachers. In Singapore, Korea, or Finland, about two thirds of teachers feel their work is valued by society. In Sweden, France, or the Slovak Republic, it's just one in 20. And that really matters. You know, what makes a job attractive is always a combination of the social status of the job, the contributions you feel you can make to the job, and the extent to which the work is financially and intellectually rewarding. It's pretty straightforward to make teaching financially more attractive, now, but it's much harder to make teaching more intellectually attractive. But that's the key because many people who go into teaching do so because they want to make a difference in our societies. Now, when you look at the countries that succeeded to attract great people into teaching, you'll find a couple of common actions that make them stand out. First, you know, they put systems, structures, support in place that publicly elevate the standing of teachers. And the basic principle is that every interaction that teachers have with their communities builds and banks social capital. So high-performing education systems organize the work of teachers so that teachers get to know their students really well and that they can play active roles in their communities. Now, public policy actively supports them to make a difference in their communities. And teachers' engagement with families, with communities in those countries is always asset-driven and not deficit. Is that connectivity? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a video recording. That's the disruptive nature of technology. Okay, I think that whilst they are still sorting out the video, maybe we should proceed, then we can play the video at a later stage. So let's uh, move on to Mr. Voter Van Dam. South-South or triangular cooperation, which promotes dialogue and acknowledge exchange is vital to realize SDG4. 
as such, how can EU funded programs, especially the regional teacher initiatives for Africa, benefit teacher policy making, leading to sufficient numbers of highly qualified teachers? And what are the enabling factors and strategies needed for stronger national and international cooperation? Yes, sir. Let me give that a try. Uh, good. Um, so I think let me zoom back on, on and start from from first from what what can we mean or what what can be a meaningful and and is an important role for for international cooperation. And I think there's two very important uh, factors there. The first one is complement national actions. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, teacher policies that's national uh, matter. That is not there's needs to be national ownership on that. And as international cooperation, we can complement these national actions and we can and we can uh, support that. Secondly, a second important role for international cooperation is that we can encourage cooperation between countries. And that is something that we can can pick up. I'm jumping to your question on what are important strategies, what we've learned. From our own experience in the European Commission uh, in Europe, is basically that it's very important to have a joint agenda with joint objectives and clear choices. And from there, that could be then translated and in, 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 in the matter of, of uh, the, the regional teacher initiative for Africa, our focus on, on, on objectives on, on what we want to focus is, is basically on teacher policy in the broad sense, and many of the things have been mentioned already by other speakers, so I'm not going to repeat them. But also we want to focus on teaching practice, because it's important that we don't stay only at the policy level, but that we also seek the translation to the practice. Three important spaces are uh, that we know that work as the first one is you need when you have this set of important priorities is that you on that focus provide uh, some funding and expertise to basically complement national actions a second important uh, strategy there is that you basically support exchange of good practices and that you support also uh, the production of public goods regional or global ones, as also Boren has, has already been mentioning. And I think in a, a third important one, uh, which we should not forget is also, if we have then objectives, is that we put very clear targets there, benchmarks that we monitor in them, and that we basically uh, make sure that the availability of data on these things is also uh, important as well. Um, also, Boren has already stressed that importance. So, in the regional teacher initiative, that's basically what what we will uh, will be uh, doing. And in all of these lines, we will we will have actions. And to make, for example, that concrete for south to south cooperation, we will stimulate uh, in in the line on providing funding uh, to complement national actions. We will have uh, specific calls for actions that stimulate also cooperation between multiple countries. Uh, we will also have under the line of, of policy learning of, of the production of good practices, there will be policy learning um, uh, activities where we will basically also bring different countries together on on, uh, on certain topics and, and stimulate that. Because at the end of the day, it's important to organize this exchange. And I think as, as international cooperation, we, we have a role to play there. Okay. Thank you very much. Shall we give him a round of applause? But, but again, I mean, uh, similar to what the question I raised to uh, Borin, uh, we missed the Millennium Development Goals. Then we came up with Sustainable Development Goals to address the unfinished agenda. The question is, what is it that we are going to do differently? Because already uh, many countries are in danger of not achieving their SDG goals. So what is it that we are going to be doing differently? And what will be the role of multilateral organizations like your organization to end? Because if we do exactly the same things, we are going to get the same outcome. What is it that we are going to do differently this time around? If you can hold it there. Any questions from the floor?
One. Okay, that's the only one. Go ahead. Um, my name is Kilebu Kilemutlohelwa from South Africa. Mine is not actually a question, but a comment. I am a teacher, like from the classroom group level. So I believe that policymakers should start with me, a teacher, because you can uh, decide to make a policy in a certain way and expect me to implement something that I was not a part of in the beginning. It's going to be challenging for me to implement because I, did, I don't know what is it that you had in mind when you were designing this particular policy. Policies are not made um, with empathy to the end user who is the teacher. Everything that is made is made to protect the child. It's like now we are in an army. Teachers are fighting children, but it is a relationship. We should not be going into the classroom with fear of if this happens, then I will be in trouble. But we should go into the classroom to enjoy our job and do our excellent as we can because we love what we do. Thank okay. You. So it's about nothing for teachers without teachers. Okay. Thank you very much. That was the only intervention. So we're moving on. Uh, we're coming now to the Director General of the Arab Bureau of Education for the Gulf States. And the question to you, sir, is stronger cooperation within and across regions is critical to ensure progress towards SDG4. And how has ABEX, which you represent here today, worked to ensure regional alignment, ensuring highly qualified candidates are attracted to teaching across the Gulf region? And what have some of the challenges been, as well as good practices to overcome them? including the use of digital technologies. The floor is yours, sir. Allow me to present my speech by Arabic language. Okay. Assalamu alaikum jamia wa rahmatullah. Bi kulli taqeed, samana bil ans wa yawm ila ahmiyat al-muallim wa dawr al-muallim al-mahwari wa dawr al-muallim al-raisi في العملية التعليمية بصفته المكون الأهم والركيزة الأساسية لأي نظام تعليمي ولهذا يعني نجتمع اليوم لمناقشة وضع المعلمين ومستقبل المعلمين والحديث الذي يجب أن يركز ما هو المعلم الذي نريد معلم الحاضر ومعلم المستقبل اليوم الظروف مختلفة والتغيرات مختلفة والسرعة الحقيقة التقنية والاتصالات ومهارات الذكاء الاصطناعي. It looks like the interpretation is If you don't mind, please start. Okay. We'll give you a little bit more time. And the floor? It's not on. Is it on? Sir. Give mine. This afternoon, we're having challenges, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's still a problem. So is, 
is the problem here or is the problem in the interpretation of the grammar? Oh, okay. So let's take another speaker. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So we are just kicking the can down the road. Okay. All right. So we will move on to the next speaker. Our apologies for that. It's something we did not anticipate, of course. Okay, so we will now proceed to Mr. Ian N. Vega, who is the youth representative of the SDG4 High Level Steering Committee, uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Sir, so your question is, young people's views of the teaching profession as a rewarding career is crucial to build future sustainable teaching workforces and mitigate shortages. What do you think are among today's biggest challenges and which national level actions would improve the appeal of the profession? Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, first of all, to UNESCO, uh, to TTF and to the South African government and nation for giving us this opportunity to be at this truly meaningful forum and welcoming visitors like myself to your beautiful country. In the Philippines, we say magandang hapon, uh, or good afternoon or good day. If I'm not mistaken, I can also say kaupona, malweni, tumilan. <laughs> <laughs> Again, uh, my name is Elon Enverga, and I'm an educator. I also come from a family of teachers and educators going generations back. Um, so I'm most grateful to be um, having this honor to speak on a calling that is so close to my heart. I work as a teacher, a teacher trainer, and a school leader at a school, K-12 school called ISBB, or International School for Better Beginnings, uh, in Lucena City in the Philippines. And... Along with being a full-time educator, I'm also an executive committee representative on UNESCO's SDG4 Youth and Student Network, as well as the elected youth leader on uh, the SDG4 High-Level Steering Committee for the next two years. Um, this means I have the unique position to give a perspective not only on behalf of teachers, but also on behalf of young people of the world. Teachers and youth are the two most important stakeholders when it comes to education. And we both share the same common reminder to policymakers, nothing about us without us. As some of you in this room can recall from the Transforming Education Pre-Summit and Summit in Paris and New York respectively, young people definitely had a massive presence and energy. So I hope you can remember that. And a milestone document was published and launched at TESS which fed into the UN Secretary General's vision statement. And that milestone document is, of course, the Youth Declaration on Transforming Education. This Youth Declaration stresses the grave concern that young people have on the issues surrounding teachers. The Youth Declaration states the following. Young people demand decision makers to put in place recruitment mechanisms for teachers that are equitable, fair, non-discriminatory, and democratic, especially to ensure people from vulnerable and marginalized communities are recruited. Young people also demand decision makers to provide quality and relevant training, professional development, necessary facilities, appropriate working conditions, and an innovative, safe, and enriching environment for teachers." End quote. Young people evidently have the right to make a meaningful or to have a meaningful part in education decision-making, since education is literally the key determining factor to the future that young people will inherit. So I'm very grateful that young people have a voice in this forum, especially, or even in a topic like teacher shortages, because we can ask the question, who do we expect to fill in the slots of the 44 million teacher roles by 2030? Who are we going to hire? Of course, young people. And the reality is young, the young generation entering the workforce have legitimate concerns about choosing the teaching profession. And if we don't address these fears and uncertainties of young people, we'll never be able to address teacher shortages. 
Before arriving in South Africa for this forum, I conducted a few consultations, one being an international one with young people all over the world. And this is a summary of their inputs. These inputs include ones from nations like Zambia, India, Australia, and Lebanon. And they express similar issues to the ones we've been discussing since yesterday, including the lack of competitive compensation, which do not reflect the cost of living and inflation, the additional administrative or non-teaching workload given to teachers outside of their regular teaching responsibilities, the unhealthy weight of physical, emotional, and mental well-being, and the lack of respective response mechanisms, unconducive work environments, poor management of government budgets, budgets and rampant corruption, and a general loss of prestige and dignity. If these are the norms and working conditions of today's teachers, how can we expect young people to want to choose this as a career path? As a result, we're losing our brightest minds and most competent leaders who could make the leaps and bounds we need to transform education. Before wrapping up, I'd like to share just one story out of many stories that came out of my consultations. There was a fellow teacher of mine who had a sister who had to daily travel long distances to get to the school, to get to do their work, cross through rivers. But besides the poor facilities, probably the worst part of her teaching experience was the toxic and corrupt culture among the school leadership and ministry leadership. There was a really heartbreaking example where um, the truth is that there's a practice that happens in the Philippines where school leaders have several checks for the salaries of the teachers. They lay them face down on a table and they ask the teacher to randomly choose what salary they'll get for that month. Yes. Um, the reason I share this story is because the education crisis has been ongoing for so long and we've had policies implemented which evidently are not working. And so the point I'm trying to make here is we need along with hearing quantitative monitoring and using those to inform our decision-making, we also need to be informed by stories like this. We need to hear and gather more qualitative, qualitative experiences from teachers on the ground because I feel that policies are losing their humanness or their humanity. And when we talk about education, when we talk about teaching, we're talking about a human-centered issue. And human-centered problems require human-centered solutions. So to conclude, we cannot solve our problems with the same policies that got us here in the first place. If we want to reach new destinations, we need to build new roads. And with both teachers and youth at the table, we will be able to transform education and achieve a future that we're all proud of shaping. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, we have a request here. Apparently, there are people who are leaving the mics open, and they are unfortunately blocking the interpretation service. So if you can please humbly ensure that your mics are off so that it doesn't interfere with the interpretation system. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> yeah, we'll check when we come back to him. Okay, so uh, we have just had the input from the youth. You can reach new destinations. It's, it's still not clear. Yeah, are you hearing the interpretation? Is it okay? Okay, so it means there are still mics that are. Just make sure, maybe it's on, but it's light, it's not on. Yeah, so just switch it on and switch it off again. Okay. <laughs> All right. Think maybe it's just having a light problem, but it's on. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we'll take questions from our youth representative. And I just want to indicate that we know youth to be agents of change. Now, uh, the only way we can effectively transform our systems is if youth come in 
and they are able to transform the system from inside rather than to criticize the system from outside. So how do we ensure that we change the mindset of the youth? Uh, like teachers, you don't do anything for youth without them. How do we ensure that they come in and then they become agents of change whilst they are in the profession? Thank you. Questions from the floor? Can I acknowledge hands? Number one, number two, number three, four, five. Please remember your number because I won't be able to remember it. Okay, number one. Hello. Yes, good afternoon. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Um, uh, I, I thank the youth wing of the tax force, but apparently we are living in a society where in the career part development of our young people still old some respect due to cultural ties, especially in sub Africa, sub Saharan Africa, where in the parents will guide the child on the career path. And many of us sitting here as educationists, if we conduct a simple census, how many of us here want our children to be teachers? Mm. Looking at the meat surrounding the profession. And what is he? and the organization, the wing doing to mitigate the idea of having young people to choose teaching as a career, wherein the parents who are paying the fees, the fees of the children going to colleges want their children to take other profession. Okay, so what are they doing to make to, teaching to, to, to meet a career of choice. Yeah, a career of choice. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Looking at the background, how yes. many of us want our children to be teachers? Your question is loud and clear, sir. Thank yeah. you very much. Number, can you switch off your mic? Thank you. Number two. Hi. Number two. Yes, over here. Um, Don't look at my head. Remember your number. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm actually happy that you mentioned that young teachers are change agents. I'm a change agent myself. I am alumni of a fellowship of teachers who are change agents. So it is a, there was a private sector, there is still is a private sector, DG Mary Trust, that has um, set up this fellowship where it gets 25 teachers across South Africa but now they don't have the facilities to go to each and every single teacher. So what happens in the fellowship is that last year I was trained for the entire year. Now I have my own community of teachers from different schools that I give off to, to make sure that I retain the young teachers in the system. Thank you. Okay, so that was a comment, it's not a question. Thank you very much. Number three. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I'm Hema Hari Ram. Um, as um, I'm here. Okay, please. Yes. Okay. okay. So yeah, the, um, mis the mistake I did is not to ask people who ask questions to introduce to say who they are and the country where they come from. Yeah. My apologies for that. But let's start with you. Thank you. I'm Hema Hari Ram from Naptosa Teachers Union in South Africa. Okay. Um, I have a the question. Noting our target is the Zoomers and the Millennials and you having engaged with them. Uh, our personal, my personal experience as a mother, and of course working with young people, is a difficult generation to work who seemingly knows it all and don't want to listen to the older folk. How do you engage, can you share in engaging with the teams, what are the concerns coming from these young, the young people around taking instruction and direction from older generation, thank you. Thank you very much. Number four. Um, thank you very much uh, for that opportunity and thank you, Mr. Enberger. Um, I think as an educator, I am Sinead Lantat from South Africa. 
uh, speaking as an educator in this country and representing, I think, other educators as well, it is uh, said that we are indeed the backbone of uh, education as a whole. And it is thus important that we play a pivotal role in the setting of policies and ensuring that in every decision making, we are there. This, I put it um, by acknowledging that when educators are part of any decision making, then they can freely be part of uh, those that are in line with making sure that they they make other educators outside be able to walk into the profession. So what I'm talking about is in order for us to get other young ones to be part of the education and actually love teaching uh, as opposed to what is happening currently is being a part of the profession and then from within influence others by the work that we do. I am part of a nonprofit organization called Teaching uh, Teacher for Teacher Empowerment. And what we do is that we go district to district ensuring that we get members who become part of this organization and then we teach them or align them with professional ethics and uh, provide them with many different uh, aspects in order for them to grow. So okay. I think as educators, we need to be part of every decision making that takes place. Okay, thank you very much. And the uh, last input number five. I think there's a mic that's on. Sure. Yes. Thank you. Uh, SK Mope uh, from South Africa. Uh, you see, I don't want the base to be dominated by South Africa. Okay, but go ahead. Uh, as I joined uh, the teaching prof profession, uh, my mother was the principal of a school, and she indicated to me that uh, uh, teaching is a is a calling and that's why after 32, in 32 years i'm still one of the educators but my question is do we still believe that the new entrants in the system they regard this as a calling because during the day i've heard many speakers talking about teaching being sacred it's, it's like you are a prophet and such that, such that but do we believe that majority of the entrants that are coming, they still believe that this is a calling? Or maybe putting it otherwise, is teaching still a calling? Okay. So I hope you've been able to note all those questions uh, and we'll deal with them during the responses. Let's go back to our uh, honorable colleague from the Arab uh, Gulf states. Uh, it looks like the uh, interpretation issue has been resolved. You can go ahead, sir. Okay. I hope everything is okay. Yes. Ready now? Okay. Uh, فالدول تتعاون فيما بينها مكتب التربية العربي لدول الخليج إحدى الحقيقة نماذج هذه التعاون عمر مكتب التربية العربي هو فوق خمسين عاما هذا المكتب الحقيقة يقوم بأدوار رئيسية في إيجاد البرامج المشتركة والتعاون بين دول الخليج بما أنه حديثنا عن المعلم اليوم أنا أعتقد أن التحدي الذي يواجهنا جميعا هو نوعية المعلم الذي نريد ربما في دول الخليج لا يوجد نقص في المعلمين حتى الدول التي ربما لا لا يوجد لديها الحقيقة يعني من المواطنين الراغبين في شغل هذه الوظيفة أنها تستعين بالدول الصديقة وبالدول المجاورة في استقطاب نوعية المعلمين والتعاون بين هذه الدول القائم وعلى يعني مستويات متعددة على سبيل المثال في مكتب التربية العربي نحن لدينا مركز دراسات متخصص هذا المركز يتولى الدراسات المتعلقة ومنها ما يتعلق بشؤون المعلمين سواء كان ذلك التكوين المهني أو إعداد المعلم أو الحقيقة ما يتعلق بترشيح المعلم وفرص الدخول وفرص الالتحاق في كليات التربية ومؤسسات إعداد المعلم الجانب الآخر أيضا لدى مكتب التربية العربي مركز تدريب تربوي وهذا المركز يتولى الحقيقة القيام بعمليات تدريبية على مستوى الدول الأعضاء وهذه البرامج متنوعة وتركز في غالبيتها أيضا على تهيئة المعلمين سواء من حيث استراتيجيات التدريب أو من حيث أساليب التقويم أو من حيث الحقيقة أيضا 
إدارة الصف وما يتعلق بذلك لكنه كل ذلك الحقيقة هل الحقيقة لا يوجد تحديات؟ بالتأكيد هناك تحديات المعلم الحقيقة الذي نسعى إليه بالتأكيد يحتاج إلى إعداد مختلف ويحتاج إلى مهارات مختلفة فالوقت مختلف والوقت يحتاج منا إلى بذل المزيد من الجهود في سبيل تحقيق هذا المعلم على سبيل المثال المهارات التكنولوجية اليوم نسعى أن يكون هذا المعلم قادرا على استخدامها بشكل فعال والتواصل واستخدام الوسائط المتعددة وليكون التعليم بالفعل تعليما نشطا وتعليما متبادلا المعلم اليوم يحتاج إلى مهارات في التفكير النقدي والإبداعي ولدى الطلاب حقيقة الكثير من الفرص لتنمية مهاراتهم في مجال الإبداع والتحليل والتفكير وتطوير حلول إبداعية فلا زال الحقيقة هذه المهارات تنفيذها أو الحقيقة العمل عليها لا يكون بدرجة كبيرة فنحن أيضا نحتاج إلى تطوير مستمر للمعلم سواء من خلال تطوير على مستوى المدرسة أو التطوير الحقيقة على مستوى الإدارة التعليمية فالمعلمين التعليم مجاله خصب ومتنوع والمستجدات فيه كثيرة والطرائق والأساليب تستجد من وقت إلى آخر فهناك الحقيقة متح... يعني مستجدات كثيرة تتطلب أن يكون هناك تدريب مستمر طوال الخدمة للمعلمين كذلك نحتاج إلى أن ننمي روح القيادة والابتكار لدى المعلمين التي تساعدهم على تحفيز وتوجيه الطلاب وتشجيعهم على إحقاق مكاناتهم الكاملة كل ذلك يتطلب منا أن نجعل من معنى التعليم هذه مهنة جاذبة وكيف تكون جاذبة؟ لا بد الحقيقة أن يكون هناك تحسين في مستوى المعلمين لا بد من تقديم مزايا تنافسية لا بد من تقديم فرص تطوير مهني لا بد أيضا من تحسين بيئة التعلم القائم على المدرسة لكي الحقيقة نستطيع أن نجذب المواهب الشابة المواهب الحقيقة التي لديها شغف ولديها رغبة ولديها اتجاهات نحو الحقيقة التعليم ونحو التدريس ونحو الحقيقة يعني تربية النشأ فهذا من الأهمية بمكان أن يكون لدينا الكثير من المعايير الكثير من الضوابط التي تحدد الحقيقة من يلتحق في مؤسسات الإعداد سواء كان ذلك كليات التربية أو كليات المعلمين أو غيرها لأن هذا المعلم الذي ننشده هذا المعلم الذي نسعى أن نوجد في مدارسنا يجب أن يكون بصورة مختلفة قدرات مختلفة ويمتلك مهارات مختلفة كذلك نحتاج إلى توفير الرعاية الصحية والنفسية للمعلمين لكي الحقيقة يقبلوا على هذه المهنة ومن هنا يعني حرص مكتب التربية العربي لدول الخليج على الحقيقة أن يفي بجزء من هذه المتطلبات سواء كان ذلك في التطوير المهني من خلال مراكزه المنتشرة في الدول الأعضاء والمتعلقة بالتدريب والتأهية كذلك هي إقامة الدراسات وتفعيل البرامج التي تساعد على الحقيقة تطوير مهارات المعلمين ورفع كفاءتهم كل ذلك الحقيقة يتم لا زال الطريق أمامنا طويل والطموحات أكبر والتوقعات سقفها دائما يرتفع بحيث الحقيقة أنه كلما تطورنا وكلما أوجدنا صحيح ما تحقق في دول الخليج شيء كبير والتعليم في الدول الخليجية يحظى بدعم كبير من القيادات ونجد أنه يحظى بأعلى الميزانيات فنجد أنه يقع في دائرة الاهتمام الأولى لقيادات هذه الدول ويحظى دائما ببرامج تطوير مستمرة والمعلم أيضا يتمتع بمزايا مالية ومزايا أيضا معنوية داخل هذه الدول بل أنه في كثير من بعض دول الأعضاء يدفع مكافأة للطالب أثناء التحاقه بكليات التربية وهذا دليل الحقيقة على حرص هذه الدول على استقطاب النوعيات المتميزة النوعيات التي لديها تمتلك الإمكانات وتمتلك المهارات التي تجعل من هذه المهنة جاذبة ومثيرة وبالتالي نسعى لتحقيق ذلك شكرا وعذرا على الإطالة وعذرا على الإحراج في موضوع التربية شكرا لكم لكن الورقة معدة باللغة العربية فاضطررت الحقيقة أن أكمل الحديث باللغات العربية شكرا جزيلا Thank you very much uh, for the intervention. So just a question, uh, how are communities that are receiving these foreign teachers, how do they receive them? Don't you have problems where 
they are not well received by, by these communities. Because sometimes we promote regional migration, but then on the other hand, there are other challenges that we are experiencing. So what is your experience in terms of that? If you can just note that. Let me open further questions to the floor. Number one, two, three, four. Okay, those are the questions. Number one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. And um, my question is, um, you have said you have put in a lot of effort as government to support teachers in acquiring new skills and keeping them up to date. But in, you find that in some countries, even when they have saved money to support the teachers and skills, they still want allowances so that if you have invited them for five days, if they don't have the other the allowances, they don't want to attend. How have you been addressing this? Okay, can you please introduce yourself, man? <laughs> Mugisha Anit from Uganda. Okay, thank you very much. Number two. Good afternoon, I'm Winston Gordon from Jamaica, and your question has been in my mind. Can you hear me? Just speak a little bit into the mic, uh, Dr. Gordon. Yes, your question has been in my mind. Okay. It is now 34 years, TFFF 14 of those years, we are pursuing the seemingly elusive objective of sufficient teachers. There must be a reason for the stubborn resistance. We need to know the internal structure of the challenge. I have ruled out public negligence, but it could be psychological or philosophical. Is the education system as planned relevant to the development of the people? Will education remove the young people from traditional industries? If we have an education educated population, will we have enough jobs for them to be gainfully employed and kept out of trouble? I am recommending an independent scientific research led by TTF and supported by the partners to identify the hindrances and the enablers of the solution to the problem. Armed with the results of the research, a strategic rolling plan of action can be put in place. We do not need 34 more years to be looking at the same challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Number three. Thank you very much. I am Balisa Precious Dowler from South Africa. Um, I'm going to comment on what Mr. Mohammed said about the skills, ICT skills while teaching. My question is how will these um, new teachers be skilled using ICT while teaching? while or during teaching practice, when they come to the schools to do their teaching practices, they are not showing those skills because they are not being taught how to teach ICT using, uh, how to teach using ICT. Majority, um, I'm from the University of the Free State. There was a module that gave me basics in using computers, but I was not taught. There was no method of being taught how to use ICT using um, teaching English as a as I'm an English teacher. The second one, he stated that teachers should have critical thinking skills, which I concur with because we are currently teaching the 21st century child. This child is not a bored child. These, ch these children are very inquisitive. So these children, as teachers, we also have to be um, cognizant on the fact that we have to know the four Cs that these children have to learn with, which is your critical thinking skills, your communication, your creative thinking and your collaboration. So even when we make the lesson plan as to you planning your lesson, they should entail all these things because children, when they get bored, then they are not gonna be learning. So each and every child should be catered for and every child should be um, 
taught these skills. Thank okay. You. So it's about how do we ensure that teachers have got adequate skills to use ICT in the classroom. Number five. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. تحدثي الآن يمكن بصفتنا النعبو في اللجنة التوجيهية للفريق الدولي المعني بالمعلمين خاصة يعني بوجود لفيف من المنظمات والنقابات والقيادات المسؤولين عن السياسات الخاصة بالمعلمين سؤالي هو يمكن موجه درجة كبيرة للسيد شكرون وأيضا لمعالي الدكتور عبد الرحمن العاصمي كيف ممكن أن نضمن أن نعظم نتائج الجهود التي تبذل من الجميع بما يخص تطوير مهنة التدريس أو تعزيز جاذبيتها سواء من وضع من ناحية ممكن وضع خارطة طريق أو سياسات ضمان لتعزيز نتائج أثر هذه الجهود اللي تبذل من الجميع خاصة بما يحقق صيغ التكامل فيما بيننا في معالجة التحديات أو أيضا مواكبة المستجدات والتغيرات شكرا Thank you very much Okay, so we will then proceed uh, and go to our last but one speaker. We still have to listen to the video. Uh, Ms. Sonnenbeck from GPE, your question is, in many low-income countries, limited education budgets leave minimal room for investments in teacher education and professional development and improvements in working conditions as well as infrastructure. How are GPE programs supporting the supply of qualified teachers in countries? And can you share what have been some of the positive outcomes in recent years and how prominently teachers are featured in GPE's current strategic plan. The floor is yours. Hmm? Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so I'll start with the, the last question because it's very easy. Um, supporting teachers and quality teaching is a priority area for, in the strategic plan of the Global Partnership for Education, which we call GPE. If you're not familiar with GPE, a little bit of context, uh, GPE works with um, 88 partner countries across the world to support education system transformation. Partner countries identify a key priority reform and as part of the prioritization effort, considers the broader environment that can support or hinder the success of that reform. Partner countries then develop what we call a partnership compact, which describes the goal of the reform and how all partners will work together to implement it including funding from GPE and other donors. So there's a strong aspect of um, alignment and coordination of partners here. Uh, importantly, GP advocates for uh, teachers' involvement in compact development. Uh, so we have the example of Sierra Leone, where there were extensive national consultations with teachers, administrators, students from teacher training institutions and teacher unions. And there was consensus with, within all actors um, for compact that focuses on foundations of learning for all. So what we're seeing with the compacts that have been developed so far is that the majority of them focus on learning somehow, um, usually improved learning outcomes. Of the 33 compacts that were finalized by the end of 2023, 29 of them were focused on, on improving learning. And most of these um, have strategies or approaches uh, to address challenges, challenges facing teachers and, and quality teaching. And several of the compacts are specifically 
uh, focusing on teachers. We have the example of Chad, where the goal is to improve, improve teacher mastery of content and pedagogy through improved training, ongoing support for principals and education advisors, better teacher management, and gender parity in the teacher workforce. We also have the example of the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the goal is to um, make the teaching profession more attractive through strengthening recruitment, professional development, and um, excuse me, and improving the teacher environment. What we're seeing in GP financing is that almost 90% of funding um, includes support uh, for programs that have activities related to teachers and teaching, and it's all sorts of activities, a huge spectrum, training, coaching and mentoring, teacher management, uh, teacher tools, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one example, Nepal, which was a pilot of the compact development process and is therefore one of the first GP countries to receive what we call, thank you, um, a system transformation grant. Thank you, I have a little bit of a head cold. Um, uh, which was, was one of the first to receive GB funding um, towards its reform of reducing learning poverty. Half of the grant that has been um, granted to Nepal is on interventions to support teachers, including conditional grants for local governments, um, for recruit recruitment, deployment, and training of additional teachers for upper basic and secondary levels. Um, of course, sustainable funding must come from domestic financing, um, as we recognize at GPE. So in a breakout session coming up next, I will explain how partner countries are incentivized to increase not only the volume, but the equity and efficiency of domestic financing um, in education, since it's the lion's share of financing for um, the country's reforms. Um, so to be continued. Um, I'll end now with a note about knowledge sharing, since that's what we're doing here. Um, the GP Knowledge and Innovation Exchange, also referred to as KICS, which I hope um, many of you are, are familiar with. It's the largest fund dedicated to meeting global public goods gaps in education. KICS works with partners to build capacity of education actors to produce integrate and scale knowledge and innovation in partner countries. And a key theme in KICS is teacher professional development. Uh, so they're working um, right now on developing a synthesis report that's going to detail the many innovations that have come out through KICS projects. Um, and then I'll end with an example of Uzbekistan, uh, where through a KICS project, um, the TPD at scale model has been adopted um, and this is to provide ongoing in-service education and, and training for teachers. It's a hybrid and in-person model that is a cost-effective and efficient way to provide ongoing professional skills development, excuse me, and it enables rural teachers without internet access to complete professional development courses offline and at their own pace. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So GP is dealing with global partnerships to mobilize funding uh, that must go towards, amongst others, education. Uh, but through your networks, and I'm, I'm not sure if your networks would include institutions such as the World Bank and other institutions, how do we ensure that funding that is released to support this country doesn't come with conditionalities because you need funding to come and address your problems that you have identified. But if that funding comes with conditions that says you can't do X, you can't do Y, how do we hope to ensure that countries would be able to leverage that funding to address their specific problems? Let's open one, two, three, okay, four, in that order. Number one. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Mohamed Chimera. I work with Window International Uganda. My question directly is, uh, I've been quiet for some time, but decided now to let it out. 
it's a, a question of reward and compensation mm -hmm. for teachers. I acknowledge that uh, teacher pay is not, uh, is not only the single most factor that can address the uh, issue of shortages or retention of teachers. But when it comes to the discussion of uh, teacher pay or teacher salary and reward, that's when we turn to uh, recognizing teaching as a, a, a calling, a noble profession, because we dodge the discussion of how much a teacher is going to earn. I work with an organization and we're employing uh, teachers in refugee settlements, currently over 3,578. But teachers, how they feel about the profession, they will say it's a poverty stricken profession because of how much they are earning. In my country recently, the salaries for science teachers were enhanced by 300%. And uh, what happened is uh, the head teachers or the principals decided to opt for teaching instead of being administrators when they are not earning enough. You find that at primary level, for some of us who might be familiar with uh, the education levels in the country, if I have a diploma, there is that pay that I'm given. But even when I upgrade to bachelor's degree, I still earn the same. It's okay. only comfortable, as I conclude, at high institutions of learning, where as uh, I progress or I got the next level of qualification, it also attracts some pay. But within my experience, I've also realized that some of our lecturers will keep in those institutions, not because of the salary they are getting, but because they're able to uh, provide services of consultants to add on what they are getting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Number two. Oh, please switch off your mic. Is it off? I okay. I think it's off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, maybe just a, just a question on... Your name, Carlos? Sorry, my name is Carlos Vargas. I, I lead the section for teacher development at UNESCO, the Secretariat of DPS. Thank you. Um, so one question for, for Christina. Uh, I mean, you've spoken about how you're trying to embed teacher training in some of the compacts and some of the financing mechanisms of the GPE. Having listened to the sessions yesterday and today, in terms of what it takes to transform the teaching profession, in terms of salaries, in terms of incentives, in terms of workloads, there are, there are different elements that could benefit from funding. So my question was, what of those elements are actually supported in the compacts of the GPE, and what elements are not and should be? Thank you. Number three. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Tsiteki Sebumede uh, from National Teachers Union uh, uh, in KZN. Uh, I'd also like to say something on this issue of um, supporting and uh, empowering teachers. My concern is uh, the fact that we do have policies, but there's a problem in the implementation of the policies. Uh, we were talking about um, the fact that we need to attract the young blood into the system. Uh, I'm worried about the fact that the government is not investing much or enough in empowering uh, educators and also in implementing uh, the, the, the policies. Um, there is coding and robotics in South Africa. It was uh, realized that we, uh, the country is behind in terms of technology <coughs> compared to the other uh, countries. And it was decided that uh, we, need to, we need to introduce this subject. Teachers were being trained, but the subject is not yet introduced in schools. And if you look at also in the readiness of schools, uh, to, 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 to offer the subject, even if the government decides to, to, to put the subject for all the schools. We are not ready. There are no resources. Now we are busy going around at unions, helping the department to train teachers, 
and then they go back to school with nothing to do with the subject. So I think on top of empowering them, we also need to fund the resources and to make sure that uh, the, the policies are, are being implemented. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Number four. Is number four there? Okay. Um, hola, eh, Lorena Morocho de Ecuador. Okay. Cristina, um, efectivamente nos habló. Ahí, sí. Ahí. Yes, yes. Ya, eh, Lorena Morocho de Ecuador. Efectivamente, nos hablabas de eh, diferentes tipos de brechas que se han identificado y que necesitamos ir trabajando, ¿verdad? Y todo esto también pasa por la apropiación que deben tener eh, los y las docentes frente a los diferentes retos. Me gustaría que eh, nos ayudes clarificando cuáles son esas brechas y eh, este tipo de brechas está vinculado solamente a lo eh, remunerativo, porque para el desarrollo eh, profesional, eh, no sé si sea el caso de la mayoría, pero nos manejamos dos tipos de presupuesto. Uno, eh, entendido como un gasto permanente que está muy vinculado a salarios. Y dos, eh, proyectos de inversión que podemos hacer para diferentes planes y programas. Entonces, ¿a qué está vinculada estas brechas? Si es salarial, si es de formación, si es de profesionalización, si es de beneficios emocionales. Eh, quisiera que, por favor, refuerces de eso. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Ok, so... I advise that because of the time, we will not play the video, but we will take responses from the, the questions that have been asked. So we'll start with you, uh, Corin. I think your question was just one from the moderator in terms of what is it, uh, how do you ensure that the instruments that you are putting in place are implemented by countries. Well, thank you. Thank you. Looks like it's not on. Is this one? Thank you, Enoch. I, I would like to respond to a question in an interactive manner, just to check. Uh, can I ask uh, the colleagues, the audience, who, know, who has read Isketi document? Carlos, you don't count. UNESCO's, you don't count. E also, Education International doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's uh, that's the first tool that we are using and will be using in monitoring the teacher shortages and monitoring the, the, the qualifications for teachers. And in a way, the data that uh, UNESCO Institute for Statistics is collecting is used it for estimation of the teacher shortages. Mm. That's the first. Um, the second, uh, who has read the uh, benchmarking, the SDG4 benchmarking work? You don't count. <laughs> <laughs> second, uh, it's uh, another uh, tool and instrument that helps in uh, monitoring what countries the SDG for benchmarking is about countries targets. It's not about SDGs targets, which are usually universal, is for all. Benchmarking is what countries would like to achieve by 2030. And I, I think I call on all colleagues to, to look at it. The third document that uh, is used also for the monitoring is who knows that there is a, a Transforming Education Summit dashboard and has looked at it. The usual suspects. So, uh, of course, I think the point what I'm trying to make here, Enoch, yes. and to all colleagues, is that obviously, and because we are speaking about the interplay between the national and, and the regional and the global, is very important for colleagues who are leading the work and the teacher task force and the audience of the teacher task force is the ones that can speak about teachers at the national level and at the global level. 
First, that they are aware about what are those instruments that exist for the monitoring, for the global monitoring, but looking at their own countries, benchmarks, then all countries target their own country's statistics to see where is the country and uh, what the country is trying to do in this context. So uh, it's, it's a call uh, for, for action uh, toward that. There was a second question. It was in Arabic and allow me in, in 30 seconds okay. to respond to it. Maybe before you go there, Please. see the second question. You just conducted the quick survey. What is the conclusion of your survey? Well, my conclusion, and it was the, the recommendation I'm making is that colleagues who are leading the work on teachers, who are the voice of teachers, have to know what are the instruments that exist yes. to monitor, but also what their countries are committing to in this international normative uh, frameworks, monitoring frameworks, and make their countries accountable, the government accountable for that. But how are we advocating for these instruments to make sure that they are accessible and that they are well known? I, I will let the teacher task force work on it. Okay. It's a very important. Um, we presented some of the work uh, in during the, the last three days. The teacher task force global report refers to the ASCAT-T, refers to the benchmarking. Even the estimates are based on the benchmarking. The funding estimate is based on the benchmarking. That's something that uh, police have to, have to deal with. Okay. It. Thank you. Look, uh, I would like to respond, and I would like to respond in Arabic language. Yes. Shukran ala ala sual. Ana nazarat ila zamili Carlos hatta tathabat anu rah tkun fi anna tarjama la 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 taqrir. O Carlos ibtasam usakat wa sukut ala matrida. You didn't get it, Carlos. I said that I uh, looked at you and asked if we will have the translation to Arabic. You, uh, you were, you smiled, then you are silent, and silence meaning agreement. Okay. <laughs> Yo, the the issue around the translation. Yes, yes. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Borin, for the response. And going uh, to uh, Andres. There's, there was actually a, qu a comment in terms of, but you want to comment? I'm not the one from the video, but I'm... I'm yeah, okay, yes. I'm not Andreas, so I'm, I can't respond to, to the video, but uh, I can try to respond to the $1 billion question of uh, what to do and how to get to the SDG4. Yes. Let, let me give that a try. I think the key word here is we are in this together. Oh. We're partners in this. Like countries need to play a role and, and making the link to the second question immediately that I have, there's been a lot of things that have been said about social dialogue. That is a very important part here. This is already at the country level where the dialogues need to happen, where we need to collectively talk about what's on the menu, what when we talk about teacher policies, what are the priorities, where do we uh, put our, our, our funds in, and what are we trying to achieve, and how do we monitor that? So I think that's, that's the first message I want to give at the national. But of course, as, as international partners, we can support. That's what, that's what I said. And I think we do that as a European Commission. We enhanced our investments in education to 13%. We're just to give you an idea, we're also investing 700 million in the GPE, in the Global Partnership of Education. We have a 100 million uh, investment in the Regional Teacher Initiative uh, for Africa. So teachers, education, education quality and teachers are very high on our agenda. This is what we can do, complement national actions, supporting um, uh, that co countries work together and that we collectively try to improve uh, the progress towards the SDG4. Okay, thank you very much. And Mr. Al Asmi, I think there was a, a question about you know your internal structure, whether the system is is relevant, and there were also the question about the research, identification of what are hindrances and enablers, and what are solutions to the problem, so that 30 years down the line we don't come and talk about the same problem. And there was a question on ICT skills. How do we ensure that teachers are skilled on ICT? And then how do we ensure that all these efforts are multiplied and that our policies are able to be responsive to this? 
شكرا جزيلا انا سوف احاول حقا يعني اركز في الاجابه واختصر كان السؤال يتعلق بالمعلمين الذين يتم استقطابهم من دول الخارج وكيف يتكيفون وكيف يتقبلهم الطلاب اريد ان اقول ان دول الخليج دول منفتحه ويعمل بها عشرات الجنسيات في مختلف المهن فالمجتمعات في دول الخليج متعوده على وجود الحقيقه الكثير من الجنسيات والكثير من يعملون في مجالات مختلفه ومنها مجال التعليم وبهذا الجميع يتقبل والجميع يحظى باحترام وتقدير بل اصبح ايضا لدينا يعني مدارس عالميه وتقطب معلمين من مختلف الجنسيات وتقدم مناهج دوليه متنوعه وبالتالي هذه الحقيقه لم تعد مشكله وهي من الحقيقه يعني بدات منذ بدء التعليم في هذه الدول وبالتالي الجميع يعني بالفعل يتقبل الطلاب والمجتمع ولا يوجد الحقيقه اي مشكله من هذا النوع بل ان هناك الكثير من هؤلاء المعلمين تميزوا وبرزوا وكان لديهم الحقيقه ايضا اثر كبير في الطلاب الذين قاموا بتعليمهم. كان هناك سؤال حول التكوين المهني واقبال المعلمين وهل الحقيقه هل لهم اجر الحقيقه على التكوين المهني؟ هذا تحدي كبير في انه الحقيقه توجد برامج مهنيه تطويريه للمعلمين اثناء الخدمه، كيف الحقيقه تستطيع ان توقفهم عن مدارسهم وتلحقهم بهذه البرامج؟ لكن هناك الحقيقه الكثير من الحلول لعل الحقيقه منها التدريب اثناء الخدمه، البرامج المسائيه، البرامج التي تكون في الاجازات وهي برامج مركزه، كيف نحفزهم؟ بكل تاكيد هناك العديد من الاجراءات لعل ابرزها الحقيقه وجود الرخص المهنيه التي تتطلب من المعلم الحقيقه ان يكون لديه عدد معين من الساعات التدريبيه ان يحصل عليها ليكن يحصل على الرخصه، ايضا الترقيات من مستوى الى مستوى اخر يتطلب ايضا ان يكون لديه عدد ساعات تدريبيه معينه، كذلك ما يتم من خلال النظام التعليمي والاشراف والتقويم على المعلمين. كان هناك طرح ايضا سؤال كيف يستطيع المعلمون استخدام التقنيات وهم لم يتعلموها في مدارسهم؟ والمثل يقول ان المعلمين يعلمون الطلاب بالطريقه الذي او بالطريقه التي تعلموا بها، ولا شك ان هذا تحدي كبير، لكن اعتقد اليوم أن البرامج التطويرية البرامج المهنية بالفعل تقدم أو تعالج هذا النقص لدى المعلمين في تدريبهم كذلك هذا ما ندعو إليه أن مؤسسات الإعداد والتكوين المهني للمعلم في مؤسسات الإعداد يجب الحقيقة أن يغطي هذا النقص ويجب الحقيقة أن يكثف عملية التقنية وأبي أقولها بكل صراحة أنه تجربة كوفيد 19 في الأونة الأخيرة يعني أثبت الحقيقة خلالها المعلمون في دول الخليج بانهم بالفعل يعني لديهم القدره ولديهم الامكانيه عندما يعني اضطروا الى استخدام هذه التقنيه نجد الحقيقه انه التعليم في دول الخليج اثناء ازمه كوفيد لم ينقطع واستمرت الدراسه عبر برامج تقنيه متنوعه قام عليها يعني المعلمين بكل كفاءه. كان هناك ايضا سؤال من الاخت عن قضيه تعظيم الاستفاده هذا سؤال مهم كيف الحقيقه نستفيد ونستثمر كل هذا الدعم وكل هذه المساندة وكل بكل شكل الحقيقة نحن نحتاج إلى أيضا تفعيل هذه السياسات والتشريعات بشكل أكبر أعتقد أنه من الأهمية بمكان أن نركز على حوكمة الأداء حوكمة أداء المعلم داخل المدرسة كيف نقيمه كيف نحفزه كيف نرقيه أنا أعتقد أنه من الأهمية بمكان أن يكون هناك حوكمة لأدائه وتقييم دقيق وصادق يعكس الحقيقة مدى قدرة هذا المعلم ومدى متمكينه كذلك تك... حوكمة أداء المدرسة بشكل كامل وخلال كمنظومة تعليمية أنا أعتقد كل ذلك سيقود الحقيقة إلى جعل المعلمين أكثر تركيز جعل المعلمين أكثر اهتمام جعل المعلمين أيضا أكثر الحقيقة قدرة على الالتحاق ببرامج والحرص على تطوير ذواتهم بشكل كبير عندما يكون هناك رخصة مهنية عندما يكون هناك حوكمة ومراقبة على الأداء ويكون هناك ترقيات ترتبط حتما المعلم سيسعى بكل ما أوتي إلى أنه يطور من إمكاناته ويطور من مهاراته حتى ولو كان ذلك بمبادرة ذاتية شخصية من المعلمين شكرا لكم شكرا Thank you, thank you very much Mr. Vega uh, A few youth questions have been asked do they still regard teaching as a calling? That was one of the questions. And how do you engage? And what are some of the concerns that youth are raising during your engagements? And then, yeah, how do you ensure that 
they are not rebellious, but they are responsive. I think that was the question. Go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate the excitement with all the questions. Um, and in case I don't get to fully answer them, please feel free to talk to me after. Um, but first of all, how do we encourage more of our students to become teachers? Throughout this forum, I heard amazing things happening in different countries and different regions about how they're promoting the profession of teaching. Um, and I encourage you to, to also talk with your seatmates uh, and, and fellow uh, forum attendees. Uh, but I am a big advocate and practitioner of teaching global citizenship. And I realized that by teaching students how to solve global problems, they actually come to realize that teaching is a very powerful um, profession when it comes to solving our, our greatest systemic problems. So I believe that's actually a very helpful strategy. Um, there is a question about how to get our younger generation of teachers to listen to um, our more seasoned or veterans, uh, more experienced teachers. And I, I can give many strategies, but I think one general comment I could make, or two, two general comments I could make is, uh, I think within a school organizational structure, it would be great to promote a more horizontal and within vertical hierarchy um, by empowering more teachers, especially young teachers to sort of be involved and participate in developing pedagogy or curriculum. They not only gain a sense of responsibility to having a stake in the school, but they realize the challenges it takes to be a mentor and to be a leader within the school and have a bit better empathy for those who have more experience. Um, and lastly, I think uh, with that question, intergeneral dialogue is a common common word that we hear in the UN space and in these types of forums. And I think within the school system that applies as well, it's really just having a shared empathy for one another, realizing that everyone is a lifelong learner, everyone is a student of life, um, and we can continue growing no matter how old we are. So the next question about whether teaching is a calling, yes, I still believe teaching is a calling, especially nowadays, since I think many teachers believe that teaching or pursuing teaching is a sacrifice, which is un the unfortunate reality, is that they have to choose this profession that they love um, over prioritizing maybe their financial well-being, their physical, emotional, mental well-being. So unfortunately, yes, because of that, I still think Teach, teaching is a calling. Um, and lastly, to answer the, the main question here of how do we change the mindsets of youth to be agents of change within the education policy system? Um, I come from, the again, the SDG4 Youth and Student Network. It's a network of amazing young leaders all advocating and practicing, practicing uh, innovations in education. And I can confidently say that young people don't need their mindsets changed regarding being involved with policy making, and if anything else, we would have to change the mindsets of ministries um, to make sure that they involve young people at all levels, whether international, regional, national, uh, to district, to grassroots. We need to cut across all sectors of our decision-making process, public, private, and so on, and make sure that young people are intersecting at all of those sectors, all, across all of those levels. and. The reason we need to involve young people, so this is just to wrap up, the reason we need to involve young people is because, again, it's an immense challenge to solve the problems within education, including, of course, teacher shortages. And young people really have the most out-of-the-box, innovative, creative solutions that they have already pioneered at the grassroots level. They just need the opportunity and resources to scale them. So if we just give um, for example, our question earlier about the education fellowship. So young people and young teachers are already helping one another, and we just need to give them a seat at the table. And quoting also the reference to Sierra Leone, they're a great example of a ministry involving young people and educators at the decision-making table, um, and how the minister uh, of, Sierra, of education in Sierra Leone always ensures that he has a, young, a delegation of young people attending these types of forums and making sure that they have uh, a voice at that table. So in okay. conclusion, hope is a characteristic that we can attribute to young people. Young people are so hopeful and truly really believe that we can fix the education system. So we just need to listen to them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Sonnenbeck. 
think there was a question from the deputy minister here about what are the gaps uh, and are these gaps uh, in terms of your interventions only linked to payments? I think she wanted more input around that. And then others were comments around ensuring that we invest more in education, you uh, mobilize more funding for education. Your comments? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your questions. I think insufficient time to, to speak about them in depth. Um, Enoch, you asked me a question at the beginning too, uh, how to ensure um, education financing, the, the money coming from the donors isn't coming with conditions. So the, the over $4 billion that we raised um, at the education um, summit in 2021 that goes to the GP funds, um, that does not come with conditions. GP is working more and more with uh, private sector and, and foundations, however, and, and, and private businesses. And so um, we have a range of innovative financing mechanisms and, and leveraging money through these, these other... Um, other new types of partners and and there's mechanisms such as the girls education accelerator that goes you know to to specific um initiative uh, specifically getting girls into into school so i'm i'm not the best placed to speak about these innovative financing mechanisms in my organization but i'm sure um some of my colleagues would be happy to do so um the other questions that we had um i i guess i'll just give some context gp has been uh, supporting uh, education sector planning for over 20 years. This new focus on uh, what was selected one priority reform to unlock system transformation is, is still very much in the early days. Our, our pilot countries went through the process uh, starting about two years ago. And um, so now we've got lots of countries developing partnership compacts. We had 33 at the end of um, of, of last calendar year, and in, in the time since, in the last two months, we've had, uh, I think, another 15 that are, are in the works being finalized. So, of course, once the compacts are are, are completed and agreed upon, um, you know, then the financing, um, the, the grant application process begins and the, and the financing around that. I, I guess the things to note about the, the partnership compacts is that they are government-led. Um, so it's the local education groups, um, which uh, have development partners, uh, donors, um, in many cases, civil society, teachers' organizations, um, uh, that, that are the ones that are developing the, these compacts. They're the ones that are building consensus about what it is, the, the main goal, um, and how to unlock change through that one priority reform. Um, they're doing this through diagnostics, um, examining you know the data, what's going on, um, examining uh, lessons learned from from past programs. So it's like I said, it's it's early days. What we're seeing is that um, you know learning is, as, as I mentioned, um, the the key uh, for many countries. Um, and then the interventions. It's it's such a wide range. Uh, I don't have a list, so I don't have the statistics to to explain um, the ones. But all I know is that teacher professional development is 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 pretty huge. It's it's featuring. In, in many of the compacts and many of the grant applications that are coming through. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there then, thank you. Okay. okay, shall we give our speakers a round of applause? Okay, so the key question is what are our takeaways from this forum? Firstly, we've heard that nothing for teachers without teachers. Uh, the emphasis on ensuring that we don't develop instruments, we don't develop policies, and we don't advocate for them. We don't monitor to see whether they are being implemented or not. So we need to make sure that people are aware of the policies that we are developing. We've emphasized on the need to capacitate teachers particularly on skills such as the ICT skills. The question of uh, mobilization of financing, it's very critical. Unfortunately, uh, we couldn't listen to the full video, but there was also a sense that there should not be over-reliance on financing. We should all look at other mechanisms through which we make the profession more attractive so that the attractiveness does not only depend on the financing. 
although we are not underestimating the importance of in, uh, 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 adequate financing of education. Promotion of teacher mobility, particularly at the regional level, to address issues of sh shortages. Let's ensure that we engage the youth so that we understand what their concerns are, but also encourage them to come into the profession and transform the system or the education system from within. So those are some of the key messages that this forum has been able to communicate. And we thank very much our panelists for having enlightened us on these critical aspects. Before we go, because we've come to the end, just three short announcements. The first one is that we have a gala dinner this evening and you are all invited to the gala dinner. Uh, it is going to happen in this very same room. If you can ensure that you are here by 7.30 uh, so that we can start uh, the dinner. And then secondly, you are being reminded that tomorrow we have an excursion. So please register your name so that we don't leave you behind. And lastly, there is an exhibition outside. Uh, the visits to the exhibition stand have been very minimal. And there's nothing as discouraging as having an exhibition without admirers. So please uh, visit our exhibition there. On that note, we are, thank you all of you for being part of this engagement and wish to see you at the gala dinner. Thank you very much. The session is closed. Thank you. Huh? No, there's still, a, there's still another session. <laughs>